by way of the equity holding trust, real estate ownership is legally and safely transferred from one party to another by merely vesting the property in a title holding trustee for a land trust and then granting all or a portion of the trust beneficial interest to an acquiring party versus there needing to be a deed or title transfer. It's important to note that whether the benefits of real estate ownership are being transferred by deeding the property to a buyer or by properly assigning to the same buyer a beneficial interest in a title holding trust in which the property is vested, there are no downsides, only added benefits and unmatched asset protection. Just a few of the benefits of the equity holding trust transfer shown here and these are benefits uh, versus the common deed or title transfer. Number one, virtually any loan payment stream can be assumed without a lender's due on sale violation. Uh, the property is shielded from creditor liens and lawsuits and marital dispute actions, probate actions, bankruptcy, and even IRS tax liens will not uh, penetrate the uh, land trust. The necessity for new title insurance, uh, escrow process, and underwriting processes and lender credit approval time-consuming processes are avoided. Credit requirements and or compensating deposit amounts are solely the purview of and set exclusively by the, the seller party. And uh, number five, transfer tax and property tax reassessment increases upon ownership uh, transfer are avoided. Number six, all collections and disbursements regarding mortgage payments, insurance, property tax, and any homeowner association dues are made by a third party independent um, collection and payment service. A public notice of the identity of the owners of the beneficial interest in the trust, otherwise the owners of the property as it were, um, is avoided. No party to the transaction can act unilaterally or independently of the other parties during the course of the trust agreement. And this precludes the temptation for disagreement, argument, deceit, or duplicity among the participants. Unfortunately, despite its tested and proven safety and superiority for the last 25 years as a transfer device, very few licensed attorneys have any real understanding of what the equity trust is all about and all too often will guide their clients in a far riskier direction away from the equity holding trust in order to best serve their own billing interests, thus blatantly ignoring the benefits and the safety features that we designed it for. But we have to say this, be wary, but of course do seek your own independent legal counsel on any such matters. We are not a law firm and we cannot provide legal opinion or advice. So some of the other benefits of the equity holding trust transfer uh, follow, but do note that this list, like the previous ones, can't be really complete due to there being so many permutations of the equity holding trust and so many aspects of it and, and so many things it can actually do. For one, the equity holding trust shifts an owner's legal exposure regarding the property to the appointed trustee who holds a legal and equitable title for some stipulated term serving as a buffer against litigation. In other words, if the original owner of the property were to be sued, they'd have to turn to the owner of the property, which is the trustee when it comes to a land trust, and the trustee being a mere fiduciary and uh, being appointed and directed by the beneficiaries uh, would not be in a position of being sued uh, under normal circumstances. Oftentimes, they would again will attempt to do it, but in every case thus far, we've uh, we've found that the the lawsuit fails because of the structure of the uh, the land trust and the structure of the equity holding trust in uh, in general. One real benefit of the equity holding trust is the third party ownership of the property. Uh, uh, in, which is not unlike an escrow process. Uh, in other words, it avoids uh, dispute, dishonesty, and unfair or inappropriate behavior between or among the beneficiaries relative to regulations, restrictions, and covenants, and contractual matters within the documents themselves. So 
not unlike an escrow, neither the buyer or the seller, figuratively speaking, the settlor or the resident beneficiary, can do anything that would negatively affect the property or negatively affect the other because neither can direct the trustee unless they're both in, uh, in, in concert and both of them together directing the trustee by means of certified mail and uh, in an appropriate manner. One of the features of the equity holding trust that it, it appears to be uh, somewhat magical at times and being able to do things that other people just don't know how to do or can't do and wouldn't do because they don't understand what it is that we do. If a tenant is named as a co-beneficiary in an equity holding trust and is leasing the property from the trust, that tenant can actually be positioned to access 100% of the income tax write-off for the underlying mortgage loan and for the underlying uh, property tax expense. Even though that tenant is not on the property's deed or on the loan or a guarantor in any manner of the mortgage. The equity holding trust greatly simplifies uh, one's income tax accounting and reporting and that the property itself can be treated as an ordinary rental for the, for the set lower uh, and as either a purchase or a contingent purchase by the resident beneficiary until such times the uh, corpus or the property is officially disposed of at the scheduled uh, termination date. The equity holding trust conveniently supports, protects, and simplifies virtually any seller-assisted financing arrangement with which uh, anyone might be familiar. For example, the following owner carry subject to schemes can all be legally and safely accomplished when incorporated within an equity holding trust transfer without any of the standard or age-old and all too often ignored investment risks and pitfalls that are so commonly associated with and accepted in uh, so-called creative financing. Now, some of these uh, so-called schemes or uh, programs would include the simple lease agreement. Someone puts a property in a, uh, in a title holding trust for asset protection and then simply leases the property to anyone that they would choose to lease to. And the property is now protected against liens and suits and judgments and so forth. And, of course, the lease agreement uh, allows for simple eviction rather than um, mortgage foreclosure and so on. Now, the unilateral executory lease option, or better known as the lease option, in some states, especially Texas, uh, is uh, essentially against the law. In other words, in, in a state of Texas, if you can't transfer the title to a property within six months, the lease option is deemed an executory contract in default, and someone could uh, be in legal hot water by doing an ordinary lease option. However, with the equity holding trust, we can bring in a tenant as a in a straight lease, leasing from the trust, and because of the IRS regulations that apply to it, that arrangement, that tenant can take income tax right off, treat the property as their own, and have 100% of the same exact benefits they would have if they had done a lease option, but without an option per se, without a bargain buyout or any other uh, documentation or reference to doing something that is uh, illegal or against the regulations. And another one is the uh, what we call the bilateral contingent sale lease purchase. Now, the common term for that is the lease purchase. And a lot of people would say that, well, what's the difference between a lease purchase and a lease option? Well, the difference is that a lease option is a unilateral contract and a lease purchase is a bilateral contract. In the former, only one party needs to um, perform, and that is the, the option or. The option E at the end of the lease period can just walk away. The option or, of course, if the, the lessee doesn't walk away, the option or has to honor its commitment. Oftentimes they don't, and that's what led to the illegality of the lease option in places like Texas and I believe Maryland. Now the bilateral contingent uh, lease purchase is a different uh, animal. The lease purchase is a contractual uh, obligation to purchase and sell at some particular time in the future. So it's a bilateral agreement where the buyer agrees to buy and the seller agrees to sell at usually a particular price at some particular date in the future. 
in the meantime, then the uh, the resident is leasing the property with the intention to purchase it at that prescribed date and time. The all-inclusive uh, private home loan, or better known as the RAP, the AITD, or the all-inclusive trust deed or all-inclusive mortgage. In that case, uh, an owner of a property, in order to benefit a buyer, can make the buyer a loan larger than the underlying financing. So when the buyer makes the payment on that large loan, the owner of the property pulls out what he needs to pay the, the mortgages uh, that are currently existing on the property, and then everything left over goes into his pocket as his profit, which is usually um, uh, provides a much higher yield than would uh, placing a second or a third trust deed or a second or third mortgage on the property. The land sale contract or contract for deed, that's a situation where somebody says, I want to buy the property, but uh, I'm willing to make the payments on it until all of the financing is retired, and at that time, then you can give me the deed to the property. Well, again, in the equity holding trust transfer, we can accomplish all of those uh, same objectives uh, without there needing to be a contract for deed. In other words, we can put somebody into an equity holding trust and give them 10% ownership uh, today in order to qualify for income tax write-off and then agree to relinquish the other 90% of the beneficial ownership at the termination of the trust uh, after the resident beneficiary has refinanced the property, paid out the loan, and repaid any, any amounts of money owing to the non-resident beneficiary. The equity share, all we do in an equity share to, to accomplish what used to be accomplished by uh, giving the, uh, the, the resident and the, the investor 50-50 uh, uh, undivided tenancy in common, uh, what we do instead with the equity holding trust is merely give them each a 50% beneficial interest in the trust and stipulate that uh, when the property sells that they will share the proceeds of sale or the net proceeds of sale proportionately with their percentage of ownership in the trust. So that allows an equity share, 50-50, 90-10, 80-20, whatever the clients would want to do. And the other one is the uh, interim bridge loan. Now, a lot of times we have people who are ready to buy a house today. Perhaps they have the down payment, but they can't qualify for a loan until their credit is cleared up six months from now. Or perhaps they have great credit, but the money won't be coming in for another four or five months. Or for whatever reason, they, they have the desire to enter the transaction today, but the inability to complete it uh, for another few months or maybe a year or maybe more. So in a case like that, the equity holding trust transfer can provide that interim bridge by merely bringing the, um, the acquiring party in as a co-beneficiary and letting them take 100% of the full benefits of ownership until such time as all of the conditions of sale can be met and during which time any default, rather than resulting in a foreclosure, would result in a simple eviction avoiding the necessity of a long, drawn-out, time-consuming foreclosure process. So you can see that uh, any one of these so-called creative financing devices can be accomplished safely and comfortably and easily with the equity holding trust transfer. So at this point, let's talk about the complexity of what it is we do. Now, a lot of people who would probably presume that what we do is highly complex because of all of the myriad features and benefits and advantages and so forth that we talk about and all of the legal protections and ramifications. However, in essence, the equity holding trust really is no more than a lease of a property from an owner's trust. And there are four basic documents. I mean, obviously, there are ancillary documents, the 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 deed to the property and maybe uh, an escrow instruction and maybe a uh, hold harmless agreement or whatever it might be, but there's four basic documents. Now those documents uh, are not complex at all. The first one is the trust itself. In the trust, an owner of a property vests its property in a bonded, licensed, professional, nonprofit, charitable corporation who acts as the, the, the paid trustee. Now, the trustee that we use is Equity Holdings in uh, Chowchilla, California, and they'll charge a fee for holding the title of uh, about a half a percent or less of the property's value per year, up to a maximum of $139, 
and a minimum of $39. And then the next document is the assignment of beneficial interest. The owner who just created the trust now names a second party as his co-beneficiary or remainder agent in the trust. And that's very simple, just an assignment of beneficial interest. The next one is the beneficiary agreement, which is tantamount to a partnership agreement where the original owner, the settlor, and the lessee co-beneficiary or investor co-beneficiary get together and structure an agreement between them, like, like I said, like a partnership agreement, clarifying their respective responsibilities and benefits concerning the property and the trust. And then finally, then, there's the lease agreement itself, which is essentially a triple net lease agreement where the resident co-beneficiary agrees to cover all of the payments, maintenance, repair, and upkeep, property tax, and insurance in exchange for the benefits of uh, treating the property of his own and uh, obtaining all of the fee simple bundle of rights and real estate ownership until such time as that party would default. And in the event of a uncured default, the, um, the party then reverts back to an ordinary lease tenant and can be evicted in a simple eviction rather than forcing the non-defaulting parties into a long, drawn-out, arduous, and expensive judicial foreclosure. Now, with each of these documents in place, the relinquishing party, the seller, and the acquiring party, the buyer, automatically get all the benefits of any fee-simple real estate sale and transfer transaction, uh, but with added benefits and, and a lot of safety first. So some of the benefits for the seller uh, would include a faster and simpler sale of the property. Obviously, if, if seller's carrying paper and somebody can come in with less than the stringent bank requirements, the, sale, the property will sell a lot quicker. And generally, there's going to be a higher price paid for the property in consideration of the terms being offered and the seller carry arrangement. And then vir virtually perfect asset protection while carrying. That's nice. Freedom from a troublesome, unwanted, or no longer affordable property. Freedom from all landlording headaches. The seller retains uh, any existing equity at start even after the sale takes place. The owner carry itself encourages the highest purchase price. The seller is allowed full deferment of capital gains tax on this, uh, quote, sale, unquote. The IRS Section 1031 and, 20, and Section 121 tax provisions remain intact. Simple eviction is used versus time-consuming and costly foreclosure. Uh, freedom from capital gains tax upon sale of the property. No limit to the amount of uh, upfront monies allowed, um, as would be um, uh, regulated in leasing the property. Now, when you talk about the buyer's benefits, the buyer receives all the benefits of fee simple real estate ownership without any uh, standard down payment or bank credit requirements. The buyer receives full income tax deduction uh, with regard to mortgage interest and property tax. The buyer gets an after tax payment obligation that's usually always less than renting by the time the, um, the tax benefits are included. Uh, if you think of it this way, you can see what I mean by that. If somebody's paying a thousand dollars a month rent and they're in a one-third tax bracket, they have to go to work and earn fifteen hundred dollars in order to pay one thousand dollars in rent. So they're actually paying fifty. They they're paying fifty percent more than the rent to the IRS because they earn the fifteen hundred dollars, give one third of what they earn to the government, and that leaves them a thousand left for their landlord. So obviously. If they can stop the outgo to the government, that means they're $500 better off if they don't have the tax outlay. So a prudent uh, owner of a property creating an equity holding trust for a resident beneficiary would probably say, you know, by doing this, we're going to, be in, we're going to decrease your tax obligation by $500. So why don't we raise your rent by $250? And that way you get a $250 savings and I get a $250 extra uh, income on the, the rental process. The other benefit for the buyer is full use, occupancy, and possession of the property even without having to qualify for a standard mortgage loan or come up with a standard down payment or even standard credit. At 
there's always obviously full potential for profit due to appreciation and equity buildup from principal reduction. And other benefits would include the full potential for equity buildup from principal reduction, loan payment assumption without lender involvement or a due on sale clause violation. All the dealings remain private, anonymous, and unrecorded in the public record. And one's home or income property is safely protected from creditor judgments, bankruptcy, marital dissolution, and even IRS tax liens. Long-term escrow-like shielding against the untoward or mean-spirited actions by anybody uh, or either party in the transaction or outside litigants. So let me give you a, a kind of a simple example of an ordinary f uh, family trust. It's usually called a fully funded asset protection inter vivos family trust or the shorter version for the name is inter vivos trust. Now bear in mind that inter vivos merely means created during your lifetime. So when somebody says inter vivos trust, they, they may be talking about a family trust, a land trust, a charitable remainder trust, or any trust created while you're alive. But let's just call this a simple family trust. And anybody over 50 years of age should probably already know about this because you might want to consider getting your assets into a, a family trust so that when you die, your heirs don't have to go through the hassle of probate and all of the expense uh, and, and effort that goes into that. So in this particular case, the settlor, the, the person who settles the affairs and sets up the trust, is Bob Jones. Bob Jones puts all of his assets, airplane, cars, his, his income properties, his horse and cow and Sherman tank into this thing called a trust. Now bear in mind this trust is not totally unlike a corporation. It holds assets and has the right to ownership of these assets. Now notice here that the trust is going to own the assets but the beneficiary Bob Jones is going to be able to use the assets and here's why. Bob gives the legal title of all of these assets to the trust. However, he keeps the equitable title for himself. Now, the difference is the legal title is the paperwork that proves uh, in the public record that you own something. The equitable title is the benefit that you derive from that ownership. So, figuratively or roughly speaking, the equitable title then is the right that comes to you because of having the legal title and being able to prove that you have ownership. You end up with the equity in the property, the right to sell the property, the right to uh, uh, do anything with it that you want to. Now, in this particular case, Bob has to appoint somebody to be a trustee. And that trustee, since it's going to be the manager of this trustee-directed trust, uh, needs to be somebody that Bob uh, trusts more than anyone else. So what Bob does, he appoints himself as the trustee. And since this uh, trust is fully directed by the trustee, that means Bob has all of the power of direction over all of the actions of the assets and the trust and so forth. However, he's not done yet. His attorney who sets up this trust for him is going to uh, advise him to appoint somebody as a remainder agent. And that typically is going to be Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones then becomes the remainder agent for this trust. And then the attorney, in order to get a little bit more money out of the, the Joneses, is going to suggest that Mrs. Jones set up another trust just like it with the same assets. But in her trust, she'll name Bob as her remainder agent. It's called the A and B trust uh, system. So Bob names her as his remainder agent if he dies, and she names him as her remainder if she dies. And the attorney gets paid twice, and it's a beautiful opportunity for the attorney. Now, here's a title-holding land trust, and I want you to notice the, uh, the, the extreme differences. It looks similar on the surface, but the differences are profound, and here's why. Bob Jones, the same guy now, he didn't put his house in the trust. So he has this house out in the woods that's beautiful and so on, and he decides that he'd like to protect it from liens and suits and judgments uh, and so on. So he puts his property into this fiction known as a land trust. And at that particular point, he becomes the beneficiary, which gives him the use of the property. And at that point, he appoints a third party to be the trustee 
and the, uh, the, the holding entity. Now, this trustee is not the manager of the trust. The trustee is only going to hold the title. So Bob gives the trustee not just the legal title, but also the equitable title. So in effect, Bob doesn't own the property anymore. The trustee does. So if somebody wants to sue Bob and take his house, they're going to be out of luck because he doesn't own that house. He gave it to somebody else, the, the, uh, the trustee. Now bear in mind that this trust, unlike the last one we looked at, is beneficiary directed and Bob made sure that he is the director. In other words, Bob is the manager of the asset, Bob is the director of the trust, Bob will tell the trustee to do whatever he wants it to do within reason and the trustee has no say so other than holding the title to the property. So as a result, Bob has lost nothing. He under IRC 163H4D, that's the Internal Revenue Code, he has full rights of ownership. He has tax write-off, principal reduction, equity build-up. He has the right to sell, trade, um, do anything he wants to with that property because he is the manager and the director of the trust. Now, just like in the other trust, Bob's going to need to appoint somebody as a remainder agent. Well, when he appoints a remainder agent, it doesn't have to be his wife now. What he can do is appoint a remainder agent who can lease the property from him. Well, they would lease the property from the trustee now because the trustee is the owner. And that trustee would set up collection service, equity management company, uh, is the one we use, uh, which is a free bill paying and collection service. And now when the payments are made, any extra money, any positive cash flow goes back to Bob. And he's got a free property manager in the property. He's devoid of the responsibilities now because those have all been passed on to the resident beneficiary. And uh, Bob is uh, happy as a clam. Now note that this is an equity holding trust transfer. In other words, it is an EH trust, and that's what we talk about when we talk about transferring real estate without needing to transfer the title or a grant deed to the acquiring party. In this particular case, the deed is transferred to the trustee, but only for title holding purposes, not for management and not for any other benefit, uh, any other benefit to the trustee. So, Remember, too, that Bob, anytime he wants to, can say, um, uh, or excuse me, in this particular case, the investor beneficiary, which may be yourself, doesn't want to live in the property, so you might want to bring in a resident co-beneficiary along with you who will live in the property, make all the payments, manage the property, take care of it, and then at the end of the month, instead of any positive cash flow going back to Bob, it comes back to you as the investor co-beneficiary. And this is a multiple beneficiary equity holding trust. So bear in mind, you can put yourself in either position. Perhaps you're the resident beneficiary leasing the property from the trust and Bob is the settlor beneficiary or perhaps you're a resident beneficiary leasing from the trust and there is an investor beneficiary named Earl between you and Bob who's making all the money in the deal. So all in all, uh, you can't s say it any more simply. There is no better, safe, or safer, or legally more pure or protective method for selling uh, a property or buying a property or for any form of seller-assisted, owner-carry, real estate financing and transfer. There just isn't. And bear in mind that the Open Door Wealth Management Equity Holding Trust that we're talking about, which by the way was formerly known as the NARS PAC Trust, has been in consistent use throughout the United States without a single failed IRS defense, or failed litigation challenge, or failed defense against any lender's due on sale clause, or even uh, unlawful detainer actions for over 25 years. We have a perfect record, we have an A+, plus, and there is no better way to accomplish the objectives of seller carry or owner will carry financing. So call us with any questions or need of assistance you might have. We're all uh, workaholics around here, and no matter what time you call, somebody will probably personally answer the phone, and that somebody will probably be me if I can hear it ringing and run and grab it before somebody else does. So uh, if you have to leave a message, uh, please do so, and your call will be promptly returned. Now, the last issue is this. Note the uh, insert. 
If you do have an unwanted property in any state that is in reasonably good condition on which you'd be willing to let me take over the payments, please call. Note that an over-encumbering loan is never a problem for us, assuming the payments are reasonably current, because we can usually, whatever the, the default might be, we will usually get that amount of money from our resident beneficiary coming in. And uh, if the property is grossly over-encumbered, and worst possible case, we can reduce your negative cash flow by 95%. So give us a call. And also, I want to thank you sincerely for sticking with us for this time and running through the, the features and benefits and advantage and structure of the Open Door Wealth Management Equity Holding Trust Transfer. Thank you.